Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome to Calvary Chapel. And um, today we're having the Good Friday service. And as you guys can see at the front, we have our communion table that says, In Remembrance of Him. And we're going to be basically preparing for communion this whole time. I mean, when I started doing this, and I'll, I'll hurry up and try to get you guys out of here because I know it's lunchtime. And, um, you know, when Pastor Kevin told me, yeah, it's, it's going to be a devotional. And I'm like, whew, that's going to be rough. <laughs> but but uh, that was probably the hard part, you know, trying to constrict everything. So I'll, I'll hurry up. But um, let's pray before we go further. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just... Lord, we know it's Good Friday because Sunday's coming, Lord, but Lord, we ought to remember and understand the, what is going on today, Lord, and what happened over 2,000 years ago, Lord, and you on that cross, Lord, and when you said it is finished. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you just, uh, just anoint us, anoint everyone who here in the sanctuary and those online, Father, and just uh, prepare our hearts, Lord, as we come to your table, Lord, and get ready, Lord. And Father, you're always constantly throughout scriptures having us to get ready, to be ready, to stay prepared, Lord, and for your coming, Lord. But it, today, Lord, it's, it's you on that cross. It's a, I mean, the this, this symbolism and just what occurred that day, Lord, I mean, when they say Good Friday, it's just what happened to you is, is not so good, Lord. You paid the price for us, Lord, and we owe you our lives because you gave your life for us. Father, prepare our hearts, Lord. I pray for this study, Lord, as we go through your word, Lord, and, and I, I just pray that it just transform us. I pray that we just leave this sanctuary transformed and in you, Jesus, and I just thank you. And I praise you, Father, and I pray that you just bring to remembrance and study and just bring out what you want to teach your people, what you want to, them to hear, what you want us to hear, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So let me just pull up the slide. Um, one of the things I said during my prayer is when I, when I was a young Christian, I, I asked myself, I said, why do they call it Good Friday? Because at the time I was so, you know, some of you guys know my history and it was, I mean, it, it's good he died for me. I, I, I should have been on that cross. I should have paid the penalty. But yet he died for me and for you and for all those who are listening online. And... I started thinking about it, and I said, why do they call it good? An innocent man was beaten, stricken, nailed in the wood, completely blameless, and yet paid the price as if he committed our sins. And this is a pretty, this is not a uplifting message in a sense, but it is to understand what Jesus did for us on that cross, you know, what, what he was paying for. You know, we're going to have communion today, like I said, so just as we, we think about that, just prepare our hearts. Because through the lens of God, it is a good day. But I kind of prefer the day that we're calling it a Holy Friday. Um, because he set himself apart for this specific day. And that's exactly who God is, right? He's holy, holy, holy. He's set apart. He's that set apart. And when he said, when that, that says that in the scripture, I believe it's a, it's, it's a pointing to the Trinity on how holy. He, he set himself apart and how much more so should we? And in this day as well. Psalm 22, David speaking. He says, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? It, it reminds me as I was, I was seeing this, one of my favorite songs is from the newsboy, it says, you are my king. 
And part of the chorus or bridge or whatever you call it, I'm no musician. But it says, I'm forgiven because you've forsaken. I'm accepted because you were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. When, when, he's, when we look at forsaken and what it means, it, it means complete abandonment in the Hebrew. Many times I know that we've asked this question. The question, why? Why, Lord? Why do you feel so far from me? Why did you allow this or that or whatever to happen? Why did you let this occur? And that's okay. We, we, we can ask those questions. We can. But see, David goes on to declare that even though he feels this way or this moment, but it's only for that moment that he feels that way, even though that it isn't true, because we know essentially that he's not forsaken. He's not, neither will we. Psalm 22, 20, uh, 22 through 24, he continues, and he says in the same psalm, the Messianic psalm, it says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him, and all you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. See, we can go through these moments asking why. Why, why do we feel this abandonment? Why do we feel as if God is not there, as if he's forsaken us? I don't know about you, and I can speak for myself. I've been in that position. I have. And I think many of us have as well if we're truly being honest. See, David saw these things, and he truly understood, even though feeling through that. But these moments that we have is nothing compared to what Christ felt on that cross. Jesus Christ was truly forsaken at that moment, and we can see that in Matthew 27, 46. It says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, after experiencing the most horrific torture and left to die by evil men, Christ recited Psalm 22.1. And this was really that fulfillment of those words. Our God, fully human, fully human, and fully God, identifies with us in every single way. I've had people tell me at times, it's like, oh, you don't know what I go through. You don't know the things that I've gone through. Maybe you're right. Maybe I don't. Maybe I do. But the one who does, that's Jesus himself. He knew what it was to be set apart. See, I believe when that happened, Jesus felt this separation from him that he had never experienced before from God the Father. Right? Because we talked about it. Those, some of you guys have been here on, on, for, the, for the prophecy. But what, what God cannot be in the presence of sin, right? Jesus paid that sin on that cross. And Hebrews tells us a little bit more on how he identifies with us. But that separation, I, I, I mean, we can't, we can't begin to fathom what that was. Remember, Jesus was with God in the beginning, right? In the beginning, God, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. The word we know through scripture, through the study, that it is Jesus Christ himself. John is reciting in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, plural, Elohim. He was there. He was there from the beginning. So we look at Hebrews 5, 7 through 8. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, this needed to occur for our sake. 
And, and, and I want you guys to understand the word what vehement means. That means, it means this, this strong, powerful, mighty cry and tears coming like just profusely. That's, that's what he, that's what he went through. The brokenness, like I said, that he had felt throughout all his life. I mean, we, we can meditate it all of our days. Think about, think about the story when they were, when they were interrogating him. He's like, you're no more than 50 years old. They're saying that to a 33 year old man. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest. I'm 36 years old and I would be offended if somebody thought I was 55. <laughs> I'm just being honest. But see, that's, that's, that's the brokenness that Jesus had throughout his whole life and ministry. And when he says that, when he was forsaken, I, I just, I don't know. I just began to really think about that, what he really had to go through for me and you. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. It says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he, for he, Jesus, made him, God, well, forgive me, for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Why? Every time you see the word that, you can insert the word why and put so right after that. Let me explain. For he, who, for he who made him who knew no sin to be sin, so why was he made to be sin? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He did it for us. He did it for you. The disciples here, like I said, they're trying to explain the seriousness of, of Christ. Paul is speaking here in 2 second, second Corinthians, but he's trying to explain to them the seriousness of what Christ did for them. That's why it says here that they are pleading to them as if God himself is pleading. Remember, we just read how Jesus cried and wept throughout his earthly life. That's what it meant, his, his earthly life. So the question is, church, is are we doing that? And we can only answer that individually. So in Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to try, attempt to paint a picture of what the Roman flagrum was, which is what Jesus got whipped with. So, because I couldn't find an adequate picture to show you guys, but I'm going to, I'm going to help illustrate this. So it's, it's basically this leather whip, right? With leather and on, on, on attached to them, were metal lead balls, like bone shards, so that every time it hit him, took out flesh, metal spikes, all these, 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 these things that were added to that, so that every time he was hit, literally pieces of flesh would come off of him. I mean, he was marred. The scripture tells us that. That more than, and, and, and history tells us that he was marred more than any other man, but not just history, not just tradition, but the scripture itself. In Isaiah 52, 14, it says, Jesus as many, I'm sorry, forgive me, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was, was marred and more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That word marred means it, uh, like a complete disfigurement. Complete disfigurement. Jesus was not recognizable. He wasn't recognizable as a human, let alone himself. That's how beaten he was before he went to that cross. Because there was so much love, suffering in his life, 
You know, like with, with his body and physical changes, like I talked about the, the story where they thought he was, you know, close to 50 years old. But it's real simple. Real simple, because we can boil it down to some verses, a couple, a few verses in, in John. And we all know this, especially John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that, so that, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be, the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, I don't know every single one of you guys in here, but if the reason we, we did this, the whole purpose of this is this verse right here. If you don't get anything from this whole sermon, understand this. This, this, this sermon or this teaching is not for you to feel bad about what you've done, but to look at the cross for something different. Look at the cross for the hope that we have in him. One of the, one of the things that, you know, I, I love about scripture is especially, you know, what, what, because I, I love the Jewish people. And it's not just because it, there, there's something about them that God chose them. He chose them. He didn't give us a reason, but those are God's chosen people, right? And I'd love, I have Jewish, I have a very close Jewish friend that I pray for constantly. Um, and one of the conversations that I, I've had with a lot, of the, a lot of my Jewish friends is I sh- try to have a conversation with them and show them about Zechariah because they won't, they, won't, they won't hear anything about the New Testament. So I typically take him to Zechariah or Isaiah. So in Zechariah 12, 8 through 11, it says, In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Harad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. And I, and I asked them this question. I mean, when did they pierce God? When did they pierce him? When did you guys pierce him when I, I asked this question? See, this was a, a prophecy because this is, this is God the Father speaking. God the Father speaking to his people. When did they ever pierce him? In John 19, 31 through 34, says, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that the Sabbath was a high day. They were going through the Passover through this time. There was a holy, holy days, right? So the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. I'm going to stop right there. Their legs were broken. For those of you that don't know, um, the, the excruciating pain of being crucified, um, what they would do is they would, they would pierce right through the median nerve. And some of you guys are, have been in the medical field, and that, that nerve right there is excruciating. And they nailed them right then and there. there was this, it was very specific. So, But this was prophetic because the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken because they didn't want them to be on the cross because they were going to die. They didn't know where they're going to die. Um, And they would break their legs so that they couldn't come up to breathe. Because the way they were positioned, they wouldn't be able to breathe unless they would suffocate. That's typically how it would last. One of the, one of the earliest, um, from, from tradition and history, um, one of the fastest, um, crucifixions was 35 hours. One of the longest ones recorded was 36 days or 35 days, 35 or 36. So it was a long 
gruesome process, so much so that the Romans wouldn't execute it on their own people. That's how bad it was. They wouldn't do it on their own people. They would use that for others. So they didn't break his legs because the word said it wasn't going to be broken. His bones were not going to be broken. So then the soldiers came, they got to, they, they came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side. Remember, we just wrote, we just read about this. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and immediately blood and water came out. I, I'm going to explain the meaning of that. So when he pierced, pierced him, they, they had to make sure that he was dead, right? Because if he if they cut him off, I mean, the death penalty was on that Roman soldier. So they needed to make sure that he was dead. So what he did is he pierced very sharp blade, spear right through his lung and heart. And that's why the blood and water came out. But the, the water comes out first, right? Because blood is thicker than water. So in the Greek, it's actually water first, then blood. And the reason I explain that is because there's a couple um, medical things that are going on here that I was fascinated why, about because I spoke to my one of my doctors that's a believer, and she was saying, it's so amazing how they got it so medically correct. Because what happens is he was dead. There is pericardial and uh, pleural effusion is what it's called. Pericardial is where the, the, the heart is gets filled with water. And so, and the plural, the lungs get filled with water as well. That's why the water and blood came out when they spent, he was already dead. The reason I say that is because, oh, they say, oh no, he just passed out. He just passed out. It was from pain. No, 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 no. He was dead. And the scripture wanted to make it very clear that he was dead. So God gave his life up. They didn't take it from him. He gave it up for us. So let's look at the, the, a bit before this verse right here. In 19, John 19, 28 through 30, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with sour wine and put it on the hyssop and put it in his mouth. See, they did this because, again, another medical thing, he was completely dehydrated. He went into hypovolemic shock, right? That's why he couldn't carry his cross. That's why Simon, the, Simon, the, the Cyrene or Serene, he helped him to carry that cross because he physically couldn't do it. Again, he was marred. He was disfigured. So Jesus, he did this, be, and, and they gave him those things because he was completely dehydrated. I mean, his, his tongue was stuck to his roof. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up, or in other words, he yielded up his spirit for each and every one of us. Now, as we've been preparing our hearts, for the whole time for communion, this happened on this day. See, this was his new covenant that Jesus made with us. See, before this, there, was, there wasn't any complete forgiveness of sins. All it was was just a covering. It was just a cover up for a period of time. And then eventually you'd have to do it all over again. Um, specifically, a lamb would cover about the sins of about a ten, you know, a family of ten or so. But it was just they had to do it constantly, over and over and over and over again. And during that this time, that's what was occurring. Josephus tells us that there was so much blood on that day, not from Jesus, but the sacrifices and the things that were occurring in the temple, that the bloodshed was pouring out all the way to the Kidron River. That's how much it was. So when he said, it is finished, it was, the word there is teleos, 
meaning that is completely 100% finished, done. There is nothing you and I can add to it. There is nothing you and I can take away from it. We can't do anything to, to, to earn it because he paid for it and he said it was finished and it was done. That's it, once and for all. So, as I, I wanted to look at Matthew 26, and then after this verse, I'll, I'll ask the um, elders and pastors to pass out the communion, but I want to go over this real quick. And Matthew 26, 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So before we go to our next verse, there's an order, because our God is a God of order, right? Now, I don't want to sound legalistic here, but Pastor Kevin always does it a specific way, and he does it in the order that it should be. And it's perfect. But I want you guys to understand why we do it. Because we always take the bread first, right? Because why? Because that's how Jesus did it. Because he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Because his body was broken before the blood came. Right? He was hit. He was beaten. Spit on. Made fun of. That's the order. So what does the bread symbolize? It symbolizes his body being brutally destroyed. And we do that in that order. So I don't think that's a coincidence in what God, why God did it that way. You know, in a lot of churches, they, they take both of them or they take the juice first and they take the cup first. No, there's an order to this. So I'm going to ask the pastors and elders to begin to pass out the, the elements. But I do want to ask, because again, I don't know everybody here. I don't. If you need prayer before, please do business with God. And what I mean by that is, is in order for us to be able to take and not cause anything to us, because the Bible is very clear. If you're not a Christian, communion's not for you, right? But as Pastor Kevin says, if you're not a Christian, the best thing to do is come up here, have a pastor or deacon or, or elder pray for you, receive the Lord in your heart, but not just believe, not just believe, because belief is doubt, let me explain, because even the demons believe. Even the demons believe. Because let me ask you guys a question. Every one of us has a mother and father here, right? Every single one of us. Do you believe that you have a father and a mother? No, you don't believe. You know. You know that you have a mother and a father. Or you know me. Or you know a friend. See, it's not just believing in him. It's knowing him and trusting him. That's the point. And that's why I say belief is doubt. You don't believe in something and know it. It's a contradiction. You either know it or you believe you know it. There's a difference. So as we pass these things out, I, I, I just... I, I'm just asking you, you know, if again, if you do not know the Lord or anybody online, prepare the elements. You can have pretty much anything, you know, it's the symbolism behind it. One of my pastors says one of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful um, 
communions he ever had with his wife, all he had was, I think he had some Sprite and an Oreo cookie. <laughs> he was like, it was, it, was, it, was, it was funny. I was like, great, that's my favorite. <laughs> but my point in it is it's the symbolism behind it. That's, that's what it is, to understand what it is that we're doing. So I'm going to read this over for you guys. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So again, it's the order. This is, this is how God wanted us to do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, Lord, we thank you for what you did on that cross, Lord. And we thank you for your, for your body and that you gave it up, Lord, for us. Lord, I, we can't begin to, I can't begin to understand why someone would do that for me. The word says that you gave your life, and yet while we were still sinners, you came and died for us, Lord. Lord, we owe you a debt that we can never pay. We can never repay you. That is why it is grace and your mercy before that happened to not take us out, to not take me out, to not take any of us out here, Lord, but to give us that grace and that gift that is salvation, Father. Lord, um, I thank you and I praise you, Father, and we'll partake for the bread. Gonna look at the continuing. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I'm gonna stop before we take this, before we pray. See, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes because the Bible says, Paul said throughout Scripture that, just throughout Scripture in general, Paul specifically said that if there was no resurrection after his death, it's like I said, it, this is a good Friday because Sunday's coming, right? So I, I, I love this day, but I love... Sunday, even better, because without that resurrection that Pastor Kevin will be teaching on on Sunday, we wouldn't have it. Our, our faith would be futile. So today is a day of just remembering what God did for us on that cross, remembering to be reverent, because that's one of the most important things, knowing that he is God and he is on, on the throne and what he did for us. And I know I'm repeating myself over and over. But it's important for us to be repetitive and understand and everything because that's how Jesus taught. Jesus was constantly repeating himself. He must, he must have preached sermons over and over and over again, and yet they still didn't understand and receive it. So we're going to do this, and let's, let's pray, for, pray before we partake the cup. Lord, we thank you for your blood, Lord, that you shed on that cross, Lord. Because it was the blood of an innocent man, Lord. A blameless lamb, Lord. A perfect lamb. A spotless lamb, Lord. A price that we could not pay. Nor any unblemished lamb or animal in this world, Lord. 
It was just a covering up all the times before, Lord. But now, as you said, it is finished, Lord. You said it is finished right before you died. Because it was up, I believe it was up to that point, Lord, where you said it is finished that the debt was paid. Because you are just God and you required payment. But nobody can pay that payment, Lord. Only you could pay it. Just like the covenant you've made. You had to walk through those animals. You had to make the covenant with yourself, Lord. Because you're the only one that has these promises that are yes and amen, Lord. And as we partake in the cup, Lord, let us remember what it symbolizes. The innocent blood shed of you, my King. Lord, and I, I pray for each and every one of us here, Lord, that as we leave today, Lord, that we remember what you've done for us, that you re we remember the, the, the innocent blood that was shed, Father. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done in my life, and I'm sure I'm speaking for all the church, Lord, that they thank you for what you're doing and what I've done, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us partake. Now, church, I I know we ran a little short today, but I wanted to give us enough time to have that prayer because I know some, some of you guys have to go back to work and I wanted to make sure I wanted to be a respecter of time, um, probably a little too quickly, but my point is this, is I believe God, again, there is no coincidences. So all of the pastors and elders will be up here for prayer. And my petition to you guys is we all need prayer. We all do. And I'm praying that you guys get prayer before you leave if you need prayer. Do not leave without prayer. Many times Pastor Kevin comes up here and says these things, but yet nobody comes up for prayer. Yet knowing each and some of you guys very personally, and you do need prayer. I need prayer. Pastor Kevin needs prayer. We all need prayer. But yet we don't go up and pray. We don't go up and receive prayer. So before you guys leave, don't, if, please, if you do need prayer, don't leave without prayer. Let's pray for them. Lord God, we thank you again, Lord, for today, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you protect um, each and every one of us heading out of here, Lord, and all of those listening online as well, Father. Lord, I, I pray, Father, that you, just for traveling mercies, Father, as if they, as they go home, Lord, in their vehicles, Father, protect them on the road, wherever they go, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you just continually, constantly renew our mind, renew our walk with you, Lord, instill a spirit, Father, that just thirsts and seeks your kingdom and your righteousness, Everybody loves the Beatitudes, Father, but they forget the ending of it. They forget that, but first seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these blessings shall be upon you. They want all the other things, Lord. Blessed is this, blessed is that, Lord. And we want those blessings, Father. But we must first seek you, Lord. Um, I pray, Father, that just for everyone here, Lord, that you just go before them, um, keep transforming them, Keep changing them, Lord. Keep changing us. Keep changing me, Lord. Lord, I pray, Father, that I be more and more of a pastor that you want me to be, Lord. And boy, do I fall so short every time, Lord. Um, I remember Pastor Aaron spoke on a Wednesday not that long ago on how, how much that he desires to be more and more for your kingdom and more and more a better pastor, better follower of you, Jesus. And yet we've we come so short, but yet you've brought us so far when we look at the long scheme of things, Lord. And I just pray that for everyone, Lord. I pray that you just 
consistently grow them and mold them into the image of your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.